Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. RF poses some significant challenges. There's a lot of magic associated with it. And one of the greatest challenges is getting RF from one place to another unencumbered by impedance issues. This challenge becomes harder and harder as frequency increases. One way to accomplish this task is by using impedance controlled features on a PC board. Now, I am by no means any kind of an expert on the subject, but I wanted to hopefully dispel some of your reluctance in trying to do this and to encourage you that it is not beyond an experimenter like you to do this successfully. Now, I've put a link in the description to a document that is full of great information, but it's got a lot of really heavy lifting math in there too. Just skip over the math unless you happen to like that sort of stuff. Probably one of the simplest versions of impedance controlled PCB features is what is called the micro strip line, which is where I'm going to start in this video. I have provided a link to a very simplified look at micro strip lines authored by the analog devices company in the description below. Lastly, I've also provided an Excel spreadsheet which contains the equations for the basic micro strip line from the analog devices document on the first tab and the more complete equations from the RF Cafe website on the second tab. You will find a link to this spreadsheet download also in the description. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, first of all, we have to ask the question, what is a micro strip line? The quick and easy answer is that it is essentially a transmission line like coax, which is formed with printed circuit board traces and copper areas. It has a characteristic impedance, just like a transmission line. It also has a velocity factor, phase, and delay characteristics like one, two. Well, what do they look like? A micro strip line consists of a single signal carrying trace on one side of the board with all of the copper a significant distance away from it and a copper pour on the other side of the PCB, which is connected either to a low impedance power source or to ground. The inductance associated with the copper of the signal carrying trace and the capacitance associated with the copper trace and the PCB substrate and the copper pour form a transmission line with a characteristic impedance. Now, let's start the process of designing our own microstrip line. The first step in the process of designing your own microstrip line is knowing your materials. Well, what do you need to know? Well, to begin with, you need to know the physical dimensions of the PCB material. This includes the thickness of the substrate, the thickness of the copper itself, which is directly related to the copper weight associated with the PCB material. See, the thickness of the copper along with the width of the trace determine the inductance of the trace. You also need to know the dielectric coefficient of the substrate of the board. The width of the trace along with the thickness and dielectric coefficient of the substrate determine the capacitance associated with the trace. If you have a hunk of PCB material that you want to use for your design and you do not know what these things are, then I suggest that you watch my video on measuring the dielectric coefficient of PCB material. This will walk you through the entire process of gathering this information. I've provided a link to that video up in the corner for you. Now, if you plan on having a PCB fabrication house fabricate this for you, and you're just trying to design it for that purpose, then the PCB fabrication houses will provide this information somewhere on their website. For instance, the PCB fab house that I use, OSH Park, has this information available at the link I've supplied in the description below. But we need to know what we're shooting for too.
We also need to know the target characteristic impedance that we're trying to achieve. And then for evaluation purposes, what is the frequency range that we're designing around? The answer to this second question will fuel our final testing of our success. So now that we know everything that we need to know about our materials and what we're trying to accomplish, let's dive into some design work. I have read somewhere that there are limitations to the impedances that we can achieve using microstrip lines. The simplest equations do a pretty good job of getting us close to what we're shooting for when we're staying away from those edges. Like I said in my introduction, I've provided a link to an awesome document authored by Analog Devices in the description below. This document has a lot of good information and I would recommend reading it. It includes some of the simple equations which are fine for impedances like 50 ohms. These equations are represented on the first sheet of the spreadsheet that I've provided. See the description for the link to this spreadsheet. The equations on the first sheet tend to fall apart when trying to create impedances close to the edges like 25 ohms. On the second sheet in that same spreadsheet, I have included much more complete equations which I procured from the RF Cafe website. You enter the values in the highlighted cells and the characteristic impedance and a lot of other cool things are calculated for you. Now in there you will see things like effective width, an effective height, an effective dielectric constant, and we say, what, huh? Well, this is all electromagnetics and RF magic. There's just something about all of this that makes the width of the trace act like it's different than what it physically is, and the thickness of the dielectric material act like it's different than what it physically is measured to be, and the dielectric coefficient of the substrate act like it's different than it is. It's all a bunch of RF magic and weirdness. This is where we have to live by faith, put the numbers into the equations, and just accept the results. Now, how do we use this more complete page? Here's my suggestion for you. Use the analog design sheet to get a ballpark idea of what you need. Then go to the RF Cafe page, put in these numbers, and then adjust the trace width until the calculated characteristic impedance is what you want it to be. Now, I wanted to experiment with the microstrip line using some PCB material that I had laying around the shop. I had no clue what the dielectric coefficient was or anything else for that matter. I followed the procedure that I laid out in my video on measuring the dielectric coefficient of a PCB material to gather this necessary information. Using the various online calculators, I determined the trace width that I needed and created my experimental first time ever microstrip line to establish a 50 ohm microstrip line. Let's go see how it worked. So here you see my first ever microstrip line. You can see the single lonely trace on the top side of the board and the grounded copper pore on the bottom side of the board. At either end of this single lonely trace, I soldered some B and C connectors to aid in testing. So the question is, how well does this work? I'm going to evaluate this from one megahertz to one gigahertz. Now I've carefully calibrated my VNA. I've connected port one of my VNA to the connector at one end of the board and my calibration standard to the other end of the board. I evaluated the SWR at seven different frequencies. At one megahertz, it was 1.0005 to one. At 10 megahertz, 1.008. At 50, it was 1.039. At 100 megahertz, it was 1.07. At 500 megahertz, it was 1.38. At 800 megahertz, it was 1.53. And at 1 gigahertz, it was 1.45 to 1. These numbers are quite respectable. Now we need to turn our attention to the insertion loss, or in other words, how much signal do I lose by putting this into the signal path? 
I have removed the load from the end of the board and connected port 2 of the VNA there instead. So what do the numbers look like? I evaluated the insertion loss to the same seven frequencies that I evaluated the SWR at. Because of transmission line effects, this was a little bit more complicated, but nonetheless, here's what I measured. At 1 MHz, it was less than 0.01 dB. Same thing at 10 MHz. At 50 MHz, it was 0.018 dB. At 100 MHz, it was 0.032 dB. At 500 MHz, it was 0.362 dB. At 800 MHz, it was 0.573 dB. And at 1 GHz, it was 0.674. Now, considering that this was my first ever microstrip and a very manual process that I went through to fabricate the PCB, I count this as a huge success. With this under my belt, I wanted to use a little bit more complex configuration for my RF power splitter project. It is called the coplanar waveguide with ground configuration. And this is what I will look at next. Don't let the name coplanar waveguide with ground scare you off. It's just a fancy name for what really isn't that much more complicated. In fact, it is exactly the same as a microstrip line, except the signal carrying trace has a power ground copper pore surrounding it at a given distance. To design one of these, we need all of the same information, plus we need to know the distance between the signal carrying trace and the surrounding copper pore. So how do we go about designing this? Surprisingly, and maybe not so surprisingly, the math seems to simply explode in many directions with the simple change of adding this copper pore surrounding the trace. I thank God that in the end of it all, there are online calculators that take all of the heavy lifting math out of our hands. I am not interested in diving into this high octane math. I am interested in getting a design that works and these online calculators do a great job of that. I have provided a link to an online calculator in the description. Now, how do I go about using this calculator? Well, I would use the analog device's microstrip line calculator to determine a starting trace width. Then I chose to use half this trace width as the gap between the trace and its surrounding copper pore. So why did I choose that? Well, simply and only because it, well, it felt like a nice number to use. Then go to the online calculator for the coplanar waveguide with ground configuration, put in the numbers that you just arrived at, and then play with the trace width and the gap numbers until you achieve the desired characteristic impedance. Now you can lay out your PCB and you should be good to go. Now let's take a look at my own experiment in making a coplanar waveguide with ground configuration PCB. Here is my attempt at a coplanar waveguide with ground configuration. You can see the signal carrying trace, which runs from connector to connector. You can see the ground plane on either side of the signal carrying trace. If I flip it over, you can see the ground plane on the bottom, just copper everywhere. But what are all these solder bumps that you see all over the place? Well, the ground plane on the top and the ground plane on the bottom have to be at the same potential all over for this to work right. When we're talking about RF, the possibility of the potential being different is very high, especially at higher frequencies. To prevent this, we stitch the two ground planes together using many, many little wires. In this case, I drilled a whole bunch of little holes through the board, put a, a wire through and soldered them on top and the bottom. If you're designing a PC board to be fabricated, then you can accomplish the same thing by distributing many, many vias around the board. You can't put too many of them. You will notice that they exist mainly around the edges, but also a few down the middle. Now, 
let's see how well this thing performs. Now, like I did before, I'm going to evaluate this from 1 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. I have port 1 of my VNA connected to one connector at one end. And then I have my calibration standard connected to the other end on the other connector. Let's see what the SWR is. As before, I made SWR measurements at seven different frequencies. At one megahertz, it was 1.006 to 1 SWR. At 10 megahertz, it was 1.002 to 1. At 50 megahertz, it was 1.007. At 100 megahertz, it was 1.007. At 500 megahertz, it was 1.094. At 800 megahertz, it was 1.26. And at 1 gigahertz, it was 1.39 to 1. So we're talking about SWRs that are below 1.1 to 1 up to 500 megahertz and below 1.4 to 1 to 1 gigahertz. Now, most RF devices are specified to have an SWR below 1.5 to 1 within their advertised frequency range, so this easily meets industry expectations. Now, let's take a look at the insertion loss. So I'm going to disconnect my standard. I am going to connect up port 2 of my VNA over here. Now that I've completed my measurements at the same seven frequencies I looked at for the SWR, let's see what I got for insertion loss. At 1 megahertz, it was 0 0.005 dB. At 10 megahertz, it was 0 0.018. At 50, it was 0 0.031. At 100, it was 0 0.015. At 500, it was 0 0.046. At 800, it was 0.25, and at 1 gigahertz, it was 0.73. So I am below 0.1 dB of insertion loss to 500 megahertz, and below 0.75 dB up to 1 gigahertz. Now, considering that this was my first ever coplanar waveguide with ground PCB, and the unbelievably very manual process I went through to fabricate the PCB, I count this as a huge success. As you have seen, this is something that you can do. What makes it possible are the online calculators. Now, not all online calculators are created equal, as I have discovered. I recommend that you visit several different sites to get a consensus and then decide which ones that you like the best. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.